Ezra today. I got to ask you a question before we get started. Uh, thanks, Brian, for getting us started. <laughs> I'll continue. It's on. Uh, how many of you have ever known someone that God has blessed uh, richly? If you, if you know someone like that, that God has blessed richly, you look at their life and go, man, God's hand is really on that person, and God has really blessed that person. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to know people like that. How many of you would like to be that person that, that God blesses, that you know that you are living out God, God's purposes for you, that you understand what God's will is, that you feel God's presence, you feel his direction, you feel him guiding you, you feel him speaking to you, you, you just know that, uh, that, that God loves you and that you're going to heaven and that you're, you're part of what he's doing. Uh, that's what we're looking at today. That's what Ezra was. That's who he was. He was a person who knew the hand of God was upon him. So we'll read that, that is six times in, in, in the book, uh, the, this whole idea of God's hand being upon him. So we're going to look at that today. Also, I want to ask you too, because what Ezra was about, Ezra was called a person of the book. He was a scribe. He was a priest. He led a revival, but uh, he was all about teaching, sharing, knowing, obeying God's word. So how many of y'all have at least uh, a, a printed Bible like this at your house or maybe that you brought with you? All right. How many of you have more than one copy of, of God's word? Good. Uh, how many of you have given God's word away to someone else? Any of you ever done that? We actually have free Bibles back here on the, uh, the wall, and uh, you can take those and you can give those away to people. Every time we do an old town with the thousands of people in Leander, we, we take the Bibles with us. And if someone says, oh, I don't, I don't have a Bible, here you go. If you ever meet anyone that doesn't have a Bible, uh, be sure that you hand that to them. Because there's incredible power in the Word of God. How many of you have been transformed by the Word of God? Any of you been transformed by the Word of God? Uh, there's a, a band called Corn, and uh, the, the guitarist... Uh, he, someone just gave him a Bible. He was not a Christian. He began reading that Bible, and he became a Christian just because a friend gave him a Bible. And so it's just amazing what God's Word can do as we know it, share it. And so that's what we'll be looking at today in Ezra chapter 7. And so uh, we'll go ahead and put up the Bible bookshelf just as a reminder that we're going through all 66 books in five years, and that as a reminder that, uh, yes, the book has two major components, Old and New Testament, but there's also components such as poetry and history and prophecy and letters, all these things. And so when you open God's Word, it, it helps to know what part am I in so that I can know how to better understand that. So we find ourselves on that top shelf over there, which is what's called the history. And so we're in this history section, and we're in Ezra. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, all those last three books are during that, that Persian period, the, the Persian period. Uh, and, and do we have the map of that of the Persian? You will go ahead and put that up, because when you open that Bible, you'll know that there's this time frame that we're looking at. This is a time frame between four to 500 B.C. Uh, the Persians were the rulers of that world. Look at their empire, how big it was, going all the way from India all the way over to Greece, down into Egypt. Massive, three million mile, square miles of empire that they had. And then also we have another image to let you see just how all this falls together when it comes to God's people. Uh, they divided after uh, King Solomon into a northern part and a southern part. The northern part got attacked by that blue uh, Assyrian empire. Were taken away in, in uh, 722, a few years later, 100 years later, 586, the Babylonians came and took and conquered the temple and took more people into exile. And then now we're looking where the people are coming back from exile, back to their promised land, and that was during the Persian Empire. So we, we read about Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah. They were all part of this return back to the land. And the people are like many of us today, scattered, discouraged, unsure of the future, not sure who they were, not sure how they should act, uh, not sure what they should really believe. You know, has God forsaken us? Does God still have a plan for us? Uh, who do we really worship? Uh, what is God doing? They were, they were very uncertain. And so ne uh, Ezra and Nehemiah began these reforms or this revival that broke out that, that 
forever transformed the, the society of, of the people. God's people used to be called the children of Israel, but then they became being known by the people of the book. Are you a person of the book? Would you like to be a person of the book? This is what we'll be looking at today because Ezra was an uh, incredible person. We finally read about who he is in chapter 7. So if you have the Bible, we'll be in Ezra uh, 7, 1. Also, when you came in today, hopefully you received the bulletin of the program. It'll have the outline inside of here. And then we'll also be putting it up on the screen for you. And so this is very important for all of us, that we actually can see God's Word. You can take these outline. You can make notes, make notes to yourself, something that you're learning. You can interact with God's Word, see it, touch it, feel it, uh, look at it up on the screen, these are all things that are very, very important to us, and that's why we do these outlines, and that's why we put the scripture up here, because we too want to be people of the book as Ezra was, as God's people were. So verse 1, it says, many years later. Well, it's good that they told us that, because that helps us understand uh, that this is a whole process, and that the God's timing, you know, unfolds. And how many of you learned that God's timing is not the same as your timing? Have you, have you not learned that? We read in Galatians that it says, In the fullness of time that Christ came to the earth. I mean, that God had it all set up exactly the way he wanted it to be when Christ first came. And so we have uh, what's called, uh, for every time there's a person, and for every person there's a time. And so Ezra was that person of, of that time that God was using, and God wants to use all of us where we are to make a difference. So many years later, so Ezra's looking at this entire story of exile returning. That's what he's looking at. So he starts with Cyrus, and he, he mentions Darius, and then between chapters 6 and 7 is the story of Esther. How many of y'all remember the story of Esther? Y'all remember that? So you have Cyrus, you have Darius, and you have Xerxes, who's the king during Esther. Xerxes had a crazy prime minister by the name of Haman. How many of y'all remember Haman? Haman had the, the great idea of trying to kill all God's people. Woohoo, let's kill all of God's people. And so that was his plan. And so God uses Mordecai, a palace guard, and an orphan girl named Esther to defeat that plan and to save and deliver God's people. So you have this incredible story of the return of God's people, the rebuilding of the temple, the, the reestablishing of the worship, uh, the, the deliverance again of God's people from, from the enemies. And so as we open up chapter 7 many years later, so you're, you're looking at an 80-year period that we've been reading about. 20, the first 20 years are about the rebuilding, and then uh, for 16 years it sat dormant. Remember that? We looked at that before. The people were, woohoo, let's work for God, and they got to work, and all of a sudden uh, they get uh, discouraged. How many of you have ever been discouraged? How many of you have ever felt that as you're doing God's work, there's opposition, and people are making fun of me and calling me names, and, and, and they're trying to get me to stop doing anything that I'm doing for God? And you will feel that way. You will feel discouraged, like people were calling you names. They, they were threatening them. You will experience that as a believer. You will experience threats, opposition, discouragement. They were writing letters to the government to put pressure on them to stop what they were doing. Sometimes as a church, we face governmental pressures. And so there's all kinds of things. And so the temple set dormant for 16 years. And then God brought about the preaching ministry of Haggai and Zechariah and said, all right, guys, it's time to get back to work. And, and they did. And they finished the temple. And so now the temple is finished. And now we have a place to meet. Now we just need the people of God to know what they're supposed to do. And so enter into the scene, Ezra. Ezra means divine help or God helps me. So in the reign of Artaxerxes, so here now is another Persian king mentioned. So we have Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, and now Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is the same king that was ruling when Nehemiah, the cupbearer, asked to go back. Remember Nehemiah's story? He's a cupbearer. He's serving in the king's palace. Given the, he's like a king's right-hand man, tasting all the food before the king gets it. He has a, a burden to go back and help the people of God. And he prayed and he fasted. And so he talks to the king. And the king says, yes, go back. 
Ezra also uh, had a good relationship with King uh, Artaxerxes, which you'll see, and then he's allowed to go back with a lot of resources. So many years later, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, there was a man named Ezra. Ezra was a priest. Ezra was, he traced his lineage all the way back to Aaron, and he was a scribe. What's a scribe? A scribe is someone who would write down God's word onto the scrolls. So if you had an old scroll that was worn out from us reading it and reading it and reading it, he would sit down with this very detailed process and write out a new section of God's word. So he probably had great penmanship. He was very patient. He was very uh, diligent. He, was a, he paid attention to details because if they had like one little jot or tittle off, they would destroy that whole thing and then start all over again. So that's just who Ezra was. He was somebody who was immersed in God's word. He was a priest, and he was a scribe, so he got to see God's word all the time. So Ezra was a scribe who was well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given to the people of of Israel. Do you know that God's word has been given to us? Do you know that this book is a book like no other book you can ever get your hands on? Do you know that this book has been outlawed and is still outlawed to this day in some countries and some provinces? You can be killed for having a copy of this book. And so the fact that as Americans we can have this book, we can read this book, we can study this book, we can disperse it and share it is a huge, huge blessing that a lot of people would love to have the word of God in their hands. So it's incredible the fact that we have this book. It's, it's not just one book, but it's 66 books combined to tell one story of salvation through Jesus Christ. It is 40 different authors from 10 different countries, three different continents, written in three different languages. Anyone know the languages that the Bible was written in? Greek, Hebrew, and there's one more. Aramaic, that's right. And so as we were looking at the book of Ezra, there's actually some Aramaic sections. And when you look at the book of Daniel, there's some Aramaic sections. Aramaic was the language of those uh, peoples over there, the Persians and the Assyrians. And so that was a common language. And so that you're going to see some of that written in here, uh, spoken about. Some of the names we already read about are uh, Aramean names, Persian names. So this is uh, Ezra. He is a person of the book, and what a book it is. Uh, this book that we hold in our hands was the first book to be printed on a printing press. Do you know that? How many of you have heard of uh, Johann Gutenberg? Any of y'all heard of Gutenberg? Gutenberg uh, created the, the printing press, and guess what the first thing that he printed was? A Bible. Yes, he printed a Bible. And those Bibles, those early Bibles that he printed, are so rare and so valuable uh, it makes it one of the most valuable books in the world. So uh, recently, a copy of one of the Gutenberg's Bibles sold for $35 million. That is what it sold for. Now, if you wanted to get your hand on just one page, one page of a Gutenberg Bible that was printed back in the day, uh, you might be able to get your hands on it for $100,000. That's what the going rate is. And so you could have a, one page of that Bible for $100,000. So it's one of the most valuable books, uh, the first printed. It's also uh, the best-selling book every single year, year in and year out. How many of you have heard of the New York Times bestseller list? Any of y'all heard of the New York Times bestseller list? Well, guess what? The Bible blows that away. Amen. I mean, just totally blows that out of the water. So it's not even listed because it just kills everything uh, not even a second, not even, nothing close. In fact, let me just tell, I, I looked this up here recently. This is 2022 figures. The Bible sells worldwide 100 million Bibles printed a year. 100 million every single year. Now, in the United States alone, we sell 20 million Bibles. How many of y'all bought a Bible last year? Any of you buy a Bible last year? Hopefully you've bought a Bible. How many of you ever bought a Bible for a family member? 
uh, yes, this is so good that we continue giving out the Word of God. So with 20 million Bibles sold each year, that means that there are 55,000 Bibles sold every day in the United States. So today, 55,000 Bibles. Uh, that means that there are 2,289 Bibles sold every hour. So while we're here at church, 2,200 Bibles have been sold. Amen. Yeah. Six Bibles sold every 10 seconds. Incredible. Incredible. So that's just a little bit about the uniqueness of the word of God. This book was the first book transmitted by telegraph. This was the first book into outer space. This was the first book on the moon. Did you know that? That the Bible actually made it to the moon? Incredible, isn't it? It's, uh, Abraham Lincoln says this is God's best gift to man. If you think about that, that, that's so true because from the Bible that we learn who we are, we're sinners, and we learn about Jesus, the Savior, and we can have salvation by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. And so it is an incredible gift of the Bible. Uh, this, the Bible is also um, the most visited book in the world. In the University of Dublin, there is what's called an illustrated Bible. It's called the Book of Kells, and there are a half a million people that visit this picture Bible every single year, making this one of the most visited uh, books in the whole world. How many of you have uh, heard of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C.? Have y'all heard of the Museum of the Bible? This was put together by our uh, faithful brother who uh, runs Mardell's and Hobby Lobby and all that, and he opened this. Any of y'all been there? Who's been to the Museum of the Bible? Anybody? You been there? Man, I, that's on my list. I want to go. When we were there in 2018, they were talking about it or planning it or whatever, but I have not seen that. But uh, they say that there's 500,000 people that visit the Museum of the Bible every year. So this book is unlike any other book as far as the way that God has used it, multiplied it, the way that it sells, and the way that it impacts people. So Abraham Lincoln, he says it's God's gift. Thomas Jefferson says this makes us better citizens. How many of you believe that's true? That God's word will make us better citizens. Thomas Jefferson also said that God's word will make us will make better homes. How many of you believe that to be true? It'll help us with our marriages. It'll help us with our parenting. It'll help us with loving and serving and giving and all these different relationships that we have. The word of God tells us what we need to have in order to act as a family and, and how to love one another and forgive one another. It's, it's incredible what God's word gives to us. Also, Teddy Roosevelt said this. He says that an understanding of the Bible is better than a college education, Right? Man, I, you can't argue with that either. So the word of God has a transforming effect on anyone who touches it, reads it, studies it, memorizes it, obeys it. There is nothing like the word of God. It is, the Bible says in the Hebrews 4, it is living it is active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword dividing our heart and soul, bone and marrow. When you touch the Bible, it is touching you back. When you're reading it, it's reading you. It, James says it's like a, looking at a mirror, and, it, and it's a perfect reflection. And it shows us warts and all. And it says that if we look at the Word of God and, and, and we don't do something about it, it's like going to the mirror and I see a bunch of spinach in my teeth and, uh, you know, my hair's got some stuff in it. And I just walk away and go, oh, okay, that's all good. And I don't change anything. That's a problem. So we read in God's Word that we're not just to be readers of the Word or hearers of the Word, but what? Doers of the Word. So that's what Ezra was he was well versed in the law of Moses which God had given so I love that God has given us his word thank you Lord for your word and that um, he came up to Jerusalem from Babylon and the king gave him everything he asked for because and I want y'all to help me with that last line because the gracious hand of the Lord his God was on him one more time the gracious hand of the Lord his God was on him. He experienced the gracious hand of God, and many of us experience the gracious hand of God as well, don't we? 
We receive blessings. We receive Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. That is God's gracious hand upon our hearts, our lives, our family, our nation. It's God's gracious hand. And Ezra had that. He experienced that. He knew that. And so he's going back to his land that God had given the people. And there's the temple, and now he's going to really get things going. He's going to change the people from these scattered, discouraged, clueless folks to some people who knew who they were and what they were all about. So number one, he's going to study the truth. And this is what every single one of us need to do. We need to take God's word, and we need to begin to study it. So Ezra, he arrived in Jerusalem on August 4th, for the gracious hand of God was upon him. There it is again. He got, gracious, he got good things from the king. Why? Because God's gracious hand was upon him. He was able to travel a thousand miles through these dusty, hard roads. And guess what? He made it. Everything was blessed. He got from point A to point B. Why? Because God's gracious hand was upon him. Uh, my mom always taught us before we you know, go on a trip, let's gather together and let's pray for that trip. And, oh, Lord, keep us safe. And then when we get to the place where we're going, Mom always wants us to text back, hey, we're home safely. Praise God, she says, you know, because the gracious hand of God was on us to give us a tr safe trip from point A to point B. It's incredible how God's hand is in our lives in so many ways that sometimes we forget to acknowledge it or notice that it's God's hand who's blessed us. So we study the truth. So th this was because Ezra had determined. Have you determined to do that? Have you determined to study and to obey the law of the Lord? This takes some determination, doesn't it? It's not going to happen by accident. Oh, I, all of a sudden, I think I'll feel like that. No, no, you got to decide, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I've shared with you before, uh, w one of the things that I, that I strive to do is that I want to try to get into God's Word uh, first if I can. So First of all, thank you so much for being here on the first day of the week. Praise the Lord that you're here to worship and to get into God's word on the first day of the week. What a blessing. So the first day is important. To me, I want to get into God's word the very first uh, opportunity that I get. Because if I grab my phone... And I know you're the same way. And all of a sudden, you have all these notifications from Twitter and from Facebook and from Instagram and all these emails, all these YouTube you know, opportunities. Uh, I can be distracted, discouraged, and I can get the bad news before I get the good news, right? So I want to grab a hold of the good news, and I want to be encouraged before I get discouraged, and I want to get in God's word before I get in man's word. That, that's what I'm seeking to do. So one of the tools that we have is we have our reading plan. And so we have this Version Bible app. Thank you for putting that up there. So this is something, this is a great tool. This is how we can be determined. We can be determined that we're going to get this app, and this app is going to remind us what time we want to read the Bible every day. You can pick any kind of reading plan you want to read. You can pick any kind of devotion you want to pick, and it'll tell you what time to read it. And so it pops up as a notification, and you can start your day every day in God's Word. And if you want to read with us, you can find Upward Church as one of the, your friends or whatever, and then add us, and we will invite you to whatever reading plan we're doing. So our next reading plan I invited people today is going to be through First and Second Timothy. So that's our next series. It's called Letters to Leaders. We'll be in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. So every single day throughout this entire five-week series, every day, we'll have some reading that we're going to be doing as a church. And it's incredible as we read together and then someone will make a comment. Jerry will make a comment. Joe will make a comment. Margaret will will make a comment. It's like, wow, man, that was pretty good. Nikki will make a comment. That was, that was, that was pretty good. Uh, they're insights. It's just like a sentence. Uh, this is what I noticed, or this is what I saw. It's incredible. Here's the thing what I've learned. So if, if you are deciding to be a student of the Bible, you, you, you continue to be a student of the Bible every single day. I, I've been a Christian since I age 11, uh, and I'm 54 now, and so I've been a Christian a long time. Guess what? I'm still learning every single day from God's Word. It is incredible how I'm like, 
I never, I never saw that before. I never thought about that before. And so I learned from you. As we're in connect groups together and someone says something, it's like, oh, that's a great point. Never thought about that. God's word is like this beautiful diamond, right? It's like every single little angle. It's like, man, it's, it's just like filled with beauty. God's word is like a river. They say that you never cross through the same river twice, right, because the water's always flowing. Same thing when you come to God's word. It's like, wow, it's like new every time. How many of you have ever read a passage? It's like, I've read that 12 times, and I never saw that before. Have you ever had that happen to you? It's incredible what God's word can do. And because it's living and because it's active and because it reflects back to us, because it's God's literal words to us, he's always speaking. So if you're saying, man, I would like to hear more from God, open up his word more. When you open up the Bible, God is opening up his mouth and he is speaking to each of us. And so that's why study is so important. Some people go like, well, but, you know, I don't understand it. I don't either. <laughs> I mean, there, right, Brian, there's times we're like, man, I don't know about that. And we kind of scratch our heads like, I'm not quite sure what that says. And, and Lewis and I were talking about that too. And, and he's been a Christian a long time. He's got a PhD. And, and we read some scriptures like, man, I, I don't know. And so guess what, man? God's word is so profound and so deep and so big. We're not going to understand it all. But that's okay. Do you understand your vehicle or your microwave or your TV or any of the stuff that we use and we benefit from? Do we understand it all? No, we don't understand it all, but we can still benefit from it. And we can still allow it to bless us even though we can't quite see it. And guess what? Someday you're like, oh, now I understand it. Light bulb went off. I was reading that. It made no sense. But now I've been a Christian for 10 years. That now makes sense. So it's amazing how God is always working if we will get into it, so we don't always have to understand it, you may not always remember it. How many of you remember what you had two weeks ago on Wednesday? I don't know what I had, but guess what? I ate, and, and it nourished my body. And so just as food is, it helps us physically, God's word helps us spiritually. And we benefit from it even if we don't quite remember it. It benefits us. So, oh, well, you know, I missed a meal, so get, therefore I'll never eat again. No, you just pick up where you left off, right? And if you miss a day in God's word, don't quit. Don't call yourself a loser. Don't say, I can't do this. Just pick it up again the next day. I, f I forget sometimes to get in God's word. Nikki forgets. Brian forgets. Like, hey, we're human. So this is not like some kind of a to-do list and we got to feel guilty if we don't hit it every day. But we do need to be determined and decided, and, and we're going to do this. And so it's all about studying God's word. So he studied it, and he obeyed it. That's another thing that's, that's so important. Don't just be hearers, but doers. So we obey it. We put it into practice. This is what has to happen. So he studied it. He obeyed it. And uh, he... Uh, and teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. So studying, it takes, it takes some effort, doesn't it? It takes some time. And I'm grateful for my parents for the example that they gave to me. My mom, I remember her giving me a Bible, and I remember even like as a, as a little kid, I had this living Bible and I couldn't quite read all some of the hard words, but this living Bible that I had had these little pictures in it. And so I would, like, focus on those pictures, and I would read those pictures and look at those pictures, and I saw David and Goliath, and I saw baby Jesus and Jesus on the cross and Jesus, you know, resurrecting, and all these great stories were, like, in pictures, and, and they, they began speaking to me even as a child. And uh, my parents would, would take us to Sunday school. How many of you ever went to Sunday school, right? Man, Sunday school is incredible because you're being taught the Word of God. And you have a Sunday school teacher. And I joked about my dad saying this, but dad would say things like, Son, there's two schools, Texas A&M and Sunday school, and you're going to both of them. <laughs> and, so, and, and so dad would, would, would make sure that we went to church. And this is amazing for my dad because my dad, he, he didn't even become a Christian until I was age 11. So when I was baptized, 
Baptism is such a beautiful picture. Dying to yourself, raising to walk in newness of life. That's the picture. And so I was baptized, and my dad was baptized at the same time. And, uh, and so dad was, was on this growth process because mom would gather us together for devotion times. And so we had this big, giant uh, golden Bible, I think it was called. It was a big old Bible. And again, half the page was pictures, and the other half had the story. And, and, and we would read a story. And, and we're all gathered around, and so there's me and my brother and my sister and my dad, you know, and he's all, he's part of the, like, the learning and the studies and learning with us, and uh, I appreciate that. So we all have to start somewhere. Maybe you didn't get brought up in Sunday school. Maybe you didn't have, you know, the parents or the grandparents. Man, you got to start somewhere and just dive in wherever you may be. And so dad began just sort of sitting and reading the children's Bible, and he would take us to church. Now, probably for the last 30 years, my dad has been a Sunday school teacher. And so today, he taught Sunday school. So he has a group of people around him, and he didn't start that way. But he's now a Sunday school teacher. How many of you know that when you teach something that you learn, you have to learn it first, right? And so that's the blessing of actually teaching is that you've got to study for it. So uh, we've got to study the truth. Number two, we've got to know it. That's the benefit of studying it is that we will know it. It is so important that we know what we know today. How many of you have noticed there's a lot of crazy talk out there today? Uh, some would call it propaganda. Some would call it fake news. Some would call it just, I don't know, lies. It's all around us. We are just inundated with all of these voices, all of this language, all of these ideas, commentary, news, blogs, videos, all this talk. What about what God says? Do you know that you know what God says is true? If somebody were to tell you a lie about God, could you pick it out? If somebody were to tell you a lie about the Bible, could you say, wait a minute, that's not right. If someone were to tell you a lie about Jesus, could you pick it out? Could you say, that's not right. We need to know the truth so that we can point out the lies. That's what, again, that's why we print out these outlines. We will tell you in advance what we're doing. So when I walk up here, it's no surprise what I'm going to be talking about. I'm talking about Ezra chapter 7. You're welcome to read ahead and make sure that what I'm saying is what you're reading. You can do that for me, for Brian, for Lewis. We encourage that. Maybe you can have discussions with us. Hey, tell me more about this, and, and where'd you get that, and, and uh, how, how did you come to that conclusion about what God's Word says there? Man, we need to be that. We need to be knowing it so well that we can begin interacting with it. We can begin saying, wait a minute, hold on. That doesn't sound right because our world is filled with all these crazy voices. And as God's people, it's time to start standing up and speaking out and say, wait a minute, that is not right. We need to begin teaching our kids what is true. And it comes from the Word of God, doesn't it? Again, I'm, I'm gonna, here's the spiel once again. I mean, God's Word tells us that He created us in His own image. And so we know from God's Word that we've been created. We're not some accident. We've been created. We have a creator. He created male and female. And so if someone comes up with some alternate idea of a, what's not a male or a female, no, no, no. God created them male and female. There is one race, the human race. If some person tries to come and start talking about all these ways to divide us and, 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 and make us different, no. We're created in God's image and there's one race, the human race. So there's one race, there's one marriage between a man and a woman right? That is what marriage is. It's always been that way. And just because someone comes and tries to change the definition, sorry, you're not going to change the definition. We know what we know. So if a teacher says two plus two is 10, we're like, that teacher's got problems, right? That is not right. And so if somebody starts telling us, oh, marriage is this, you can now marry your hamster. No, you can't. That is not right. You can marry yourself. No, you can't. And we begin standing firm and go, no, this is what the truth is. There's one way to God. It's Jesus Christ. There's one way to be saved, and it's by grace through faith in Christ. It's not by works. There's God's word. There's God's truth. There's what he says about humanity, life, sin, salvation. It's all here for us to know. Know. 
so that we can live how he's called us to live. What a blessing to have what God's word says. What a blessing to be able to open it up and go, oh, wow, now I know. Ezra was one who studied the truth and he knew the truth. Verse 12, from Artaxerxes, the king of kings, to Ezra the priest. I guess I should stop right there because it's so easy to read the Old Testament or the Bible and go, oh, well, that's that person. You know, oh, yeah, that's, that's God's people. You know what? We're God's people, aren't we? Oh, Ezra, oh, he's a priest. Oh, you know what? You are a priest. Let me just read to you a couple of verses of scripture because the Bible is so descriptive when it comes to who we are as his people. And we didn't know who we are. We didn't know that we're the body of Christ. You know, some of us are ears and noses and we all are a part of the body. We are the children of God. We are citizens of heaven. We're just passing through and the heaven is our home. So we're citizens. We're a body. We're part of the family. Also, uh, this is what um, John reminds us of in Revelation. John records the Revelation and he says this, that um, all glory to him who loves us and has freed us from sins by shedding his blood for us. Amen. We, he has made us a kingdom of priests. So John is saying that because of what Christ has done, we are now a kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? A priest represents God. A priest ministers in God's name. A priest is like a conduit between us and somebody else. You are a priest. You're a kingdom of priests. So it's not just Ezra who's called to do this, but we're called to do this. Also, it says in uh, 1 Peter 2 that we are living stones, that God is building a spiritual temple, and you are his holy priest. So two times in the scripture, we're referred to as priests. So do you know it? Will you live it? Will you become who God says that you are? So we study, we obey. We know, we live. Verse 14, I and my counsel of seven hereby instruct you to conduct an inquiry into the situation in Judah and Jerusalem based on your God's law, which is in your hand. So Ezra, again, man, he knows it, he studies it, he obeys it, and he's holding on to it in his hand. So it's like, it's like, a, it's like another appendage for him. Incredible. He, he, God's word is in his heart, but it's also in his hand, ready to show. Let me show you that. And he's living it out in such a way that Artaxerxes is definitely impacted. Wouldn't you like to impact people by the way that you live? People say, man, that guy follows the Lord. Any silver and gold that's left may be used in whatever way you and your colleagues feel is the will of your God. Again, another important thing. What God's word shows us is what God's will is. So many people try to make God's will some kind of nebulous thing. Oh, let me go and, 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 and try to figure out what God's will is. You know what God's will is? It's in his word. We can open up God's word and hear what God's will is. And it plainly says what God's will is. It is God's will that no one perish, but everyone come to repentance. God's will is that people get saved. Are you saved? If you're saved, then you're now following God's will. It is God's will that we live, that we flee from sexual immorality and that we live as his holy people. That's God's will. Are you living as a holy person fleeing from sexual immorality? You're following God's will if you're doing that. So we are we know what God's will is because it's in God's word. Verse 20, if you need anything else for your God's temple or any needs, uh, you can take it from the royal treasury. Blessing after blessing after blessing. Artaxerxes the king hereby sent this decree to all the treasures in the province west of the Euphrates. You are to give Ezra the priest, again, we're priests as well, and teacher, the law of God of heaven. So Artaxerxes is acknowledging that God is the God of heaven. Whatever he requests of you, be careful to provide whatever the God of heaven demands for his temple. What an impact. Here's a pagan king who is acknowledging God's hand upon a man and God's work in the temple, and God is the God of heaven. Why should we risk bringing God's anger against the realm and the king and his sons. So Ezra, 
is studying the truth, knowing the truth, and he transformed the society where he lived. I want to read to you um, something here, just a second. Um, Ezra so transformed the society that he was living in that by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, uh, it was totally different. 500 years later, when Jesus comes, it, it was drastically different than when Ezra started. When Jesus was there teaching, he was called rabbi, he was teaching, and uh, he would often remind people, surely you've read, or, 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 or have you not read, meaning you know, he knows that they did read, read, but don't forget about this. So Jesus was a teacher because they had this whole teaching mentality and they had these groups of rabbis and they had these rabbinical schools. And so you would apply for these rabbinical schools like trying to get into Harvard or Yale or Princeton. And so if you were an up-and-coming young Jewish guy, you would apply to be under Gamaliel's teaching. So the Apostle Paul was like under the Harvard of that time, which was Gamaliel. And so all these different teachers had these disciples that would follow them around. John the Baptist had disciples. Jesus had disciples. Guess what? Guess who Jesus' disciples were? They were the rejects that nobody else wanted. Like, okay, that guy's too dumb, and he's, he's just a fisherman. Go fish, man. You can't cut it here in this school. And so Jesus took, you know, the, the, the teenagers that nobody else wanted. That's what I love about Jesus. Let me take a, a ragtag group of folks, and let me transform the world with these guys. So uh, you had this whole teaching emphasis, which came from Ezra. So Ezra is what's called the, fo the founder of of the modern Jewish movement. Ezra was the one, if you've ever gone to Sunday school or gone to a small group, you can thank Ezra because he's the one who, who began organizing those types of, of trainings. Synagogues. How many of you have heard of a synagogue? Synagogue means place where we meet. And so Ezra began this whole synagogue movement to where if you had 10 Jewish adult males, they, that would be time to start a synagogue, a gathering place where men could gather to teach one another, women could teach one another, children could be taught, the word of God could be read publicly. And when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus himself even going to a synagogue, hearing the word of God read to him, reading the word of God himself. That's what Ezra did. He took a ragtag group of crazy people, and he made them people of the book where they knew what they knew. We are God's people. We're, we're, we're a holy temple. We're, we're called to do what God has called us to do. And, and they began living that way, and it was because of who Ezra was. He studied. He knew, and he taught. So the church is also a teaching organization, isn't it? We come and we gather, we praise, we worship, we fellowship, but we also, there's teaching from God's word. That's, that's who we are. Uh, remember in Deuteronomy 6, we had a whole chapter earlier this year in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6 says, uh, take these words and uh, teach them to your children. Impress, and that word impress means like you have clay, and you're making this impression on the clay to where the clay's not the same anymore because it's been impressed with that seal. And so it's like a permanent change. Now I have God's word in me. I can't be different because, man, it's like it made this huge impression on me. And so we're to impress that upon our children as you're walking down the road, as you're sitting at home, as you're doing life as a family, we're teaching God's word. So as a people, we're a teaching people. Jesus. His last words to his disciples, he's about to be taken up into heaven. Well, wait, wait, one last thing, guys, before I go. Ready? I want you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, one more thing, don't forget, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So as his followers, as his believers, Holy Spirit, we're to be teachers, teaching people what Jesus has said. So the teaching falls on you and it falls on me. We're teachers because that's what God has called us to be. So we study it, we know it, we learn it, we practice it, we obey it, and we teach it. So I hope and I pray that you'll lean into God's word, knowing it, studying it, reading it, 
teaching it to other people. This is what Ezra did. So that's number three. Number one, study. Number two, know the truth. Number three, teach the truth. Teach the law to anyone who does not know it. Verse 26, verse 27, praise the Lord, the God of our ancestors who made the king want to beautify the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and praise him for demonstrating such unfailing love to me by honoring me before the king and his council and all his mighty nobles. I felt encouraged because the gracious hand of the Lord my God was upon me. So as we, as we close today, I think about two stories about the hand of God. One story is back in the olden days when they had the old general stores, you know, and they had the shopkeeper and they had this big old jar. And up on the counter near the register was this jar with candy. And so for one penny, you could give the store owner the penny, and you could reach in and get you a handful of candy and put it into like a little paper sack. And so a little boy came in with his friend, and he had his penny, and he gave it to the shopkeeper. And he's like, all right, you know, uh, young man, go ahead and reach your hand in there and get you some candy. And the little boy just kind of looked at him like he didn't understand what he was talking about. Come on, son, reach in there and get you some candy. He just kind of looked at him. Finally, the shopkeeper just said, all right. And he reaches in there, and he grabs a handful, and he puts it in the bag. And the two boys leave. And one of the boys asked the other boy, hey, why didn't you reach your hand in there? Why did you let the shopkeeper reach his hand in there? And he said, because his hand is bigger than my hand. <laughs> right? Woo! And he's going to get more. <laughs> and he's going to put more in my bag. He's going to fill my bag almost to overflowing. I couldn't do that. And so I want to ask you today, do you want to depend upon your little hands or you want to depend on God's big hand to bring blessing upon your life? And, and, and it happens as we realize that we can have God's gracious hand when we're looking at his word, studying his word, depending on his word, living his word. We have God's gracious, mighty hand that's in our lives. Also, the other story that reminds me of God's hand is the fact that, you know, it really depends on whose hand things are in, isn't it? Like, if I were to take a football, I love football. A football in my hand is probably worth 30 bucks. A football in the hand of Tom Brady, you know what that's worth? $500 million. That's how much it's worth in his hands. It all depends on whose hand it is in. A basketball in my hand. It's worth about 40 bucks. But in the hand of LeBron James, you know how much a basketball is worth? He's now a billionaire. A billion dollars in the hand of LeBron James. It all depends on whose hand it's in. A few nails in my hand makes for a disaster. But a few nails in the hand of God means salvation for the whole world. It all depends on whose hand it's in. And so today, as God's people, will we put ourselves in God's hands? Will we trust the hands that have saved us, that died for us, that are leading us, that are guiding us? Will we put ourselves in God's hands? Or will we go our own way? Choice is ours. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is living and active. Thank you for Ezra who transformed the people around him because of your hand that was upon him as he studied your word as he obeyed your word, as he lived your word, as he knew your word, as he shared your word, as he taught your word. Lord, may we be the, the same type of people like Ezra. May we know your word, study your word, read your word daily, weekly. May we share it with our family, share it with our friends. May we be people of the book. We know your word transforms lives hearts, nations, societies. Lord, we want to be all about that. So thank you for the difference that you make, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.